are you tearing up? <laughs> it's just about it. screamed right now, but I'm not even there. <laughs> now that's inspirational, Natalie. <laughs> I feel inspired today. <laughs> are you this. kidding? I could be here for another hour. No. <laughs> and then I was in top of my class. Uh, there were only two of us, and the other guy was in the hospital. So uh, <laughs> here I am. <laughs> and I always go, he winds up homeless on the street. It's my fault. Yeah, now you sound like wife. And you can get off. Call him Google. Call him Google. Call him Google. Alexa, how did you get across? <laughs> Paul, I cut you off early. What were you going to say? What? <laughs> Dang it. Don't do that to me, Paul. Don't do that to me, man. Thanks. I don't know what got into my head, but I thought, I thought this thought, you know, if I'm working year-round, I might as well get paid year-round. <laughs> Sweet Talk is a weekly 20-minute podcast brought to you by the Continuing Education and Workforce Training Division of Idaho State University's College of Technology. Find us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and SoundCloud, and subscribe today. Now, it's time to get started with Sweet Talk. Okay, everybody, welcome. Uh, this is Gary Salazar talking to you uh, in Paul's place. We're uh, joining uh, for one more session of Sweet Talk, and we have a great uh, a great podcast for you today. Joined today by uh, Angela Wilhelm, who's our, our marketing coordinator here in Continuing Ed Workforce Training at Idaho State University. Angela, welcome. I appreciate you hosting this for us. Thank you Thank very, you. very, very much. And for those of you who are, are going to be listening, those of you who can see, we have a familiar face uh, joining us, uh, Chef Jason Knapp. He has been with us in the past for some podcasts, been very, very uh, kind in a lot of things that he's done. He's become the world travel. We talked about that during uh, the last podcast. Maybe we can get into that a little bit again. Remember, that was Paris and London and some great food. And this is there's supposed to be the second of three uh, chef kind of a, podcast that we wanted to do talking about the world of, of chefdom and welcome uh, Jason appreciate you coming on back chef you you've been awesome in the past and I'm looking forward to this podcast with you all right I'll try not to let you down thanks for having me back again <laughs> yeah and, and and we are noticing right now that you're wearing your outfit uh, after after you did the uh, the tour over in Europe where you you visit those fabulous countries you know you, you went ahead and you did something uh, really odd you went back to work. Can you, what are you doing now? I did. Yes. You know, it's it's funny. Once food service gets in your blood, it's very difficult to get it out. Um, so I was able, fortunate enough to stay home and help my wife with her business for about 10 months. And then uh, Performance Food Service, which is the company I work for now, uh, people I've worked with in the past called me up and said, hey, would you ever consider talking about something? I said, yeah, I will always talk, you know. And I mean, I, Gary, I couldn't stay away long enough. I mean, I, I created the podcast on how to talk to other chefs while I was off. So it's just, it's something about cooking and it, like I said, it gets in your blood and it, it doesn't leave. So yeah, I'm uh, <laughs> there as their executive chef now helping restaurants and chefs and cooks alike learn how to make money in food service. Oh, that's great. And you bring such a, such a flavor, if I can, a flavor of expertise uh, to that. How about uh, that? Yeah. And, and you do so, so good with that. Are you still in Arkansas then doing that? Absolutely, yes. Uh, Performance Food Service of Little Rock. So we cover about six states, just the portions of it, but mainly the state of Arkansas. You know, I, I get the Arkansas Economic Development Newsletter, and that state is just going gangbusters with all the things that it's doing there. You know, you're, you're in a great place and, and bringing now and expanding on the food service. That's awesome. Congratulations on the new job. Um, Angela, and I, we want to talk to you about uh, about chefs. You know, and, and this part, uh, we wanted to initially talk about, hey, what does it take for a chef to get a job now? I mean, is there a career path for a job? Where do you start? I mean, you started at the most fantastic place of all. <laughs> if I recall right, that was Waffle House. It was. And, and yes. you went to, you skyrocketed in your career. You went to the governor's mansion there. Uh, you know, Correct. and you just had a fantastic path. So if there's other aspiring chefs out there or people who want to get into the food service industry, you know, we want to talk about mm -hmm. what does it take? You know, what's a good career path? What do you need to do to be a chef? So at the at the at the outset, I mean, does everybody need to start at Waffle House? Is is that a great place? Is that the only place? Where do you <laughs> Absolutely go? Absolutely not. To, to I, your I would not recommend that. Honestly, uh, <laughs> as much as I like uh, my story and my background there, the 
uh, starting at Waffle House can be a little daunting, you know, <laughs> uh, it might make people run. Uh, no, I mean, the, <laughs> the main thing, yeah, I give you the funny answer is you have to be able to uh, wash your clothes and have proper personal hygiene mm-hmm. and be on time. That'll get mm-hmm. you about 75% of the way to being successful <laughs> in public service. But really it's, so to become a chef or to become a member of food service community here, you know, you just have to have a passion for it. It's hard work and you have to want to do those things. And I mean, people who are successful, uh, a lot of them actually, they took jobs with people that didn't even pay them. They took jobs with people who would allow them to come in the kitchen and learn what they were cooking, learn what they were teaching and just come in and, and do it for free just because they had the opportunity to be in the kitchen with them. Uh, I personally never did that. I am a capitalist and I like money. And (laughs) so um, it was, mine was uh, really, I was blessed to know a lot of great people and a lot of great people who uh, would push me in the right direction and give me the right advice. So always learning uh, never stop learning and always looking to do uh, above and beyond the person beside you. So once again, hard work really pays off in this industry and uh, you learn everywhere you go, every single place that you go and you learn uh, a new dish or a new technique or a new piece of produce or a new way to fabricate something. So it's all about learning those techniques and getting the foundation and then moving on to the next job, applying those techniques and learning the new ones and then just building upon your repertoire uh, for the entirety of your career. Oh, wow. That's great. A lot of that fits into what we see. And, and, you know, Angela and I were talking about this some time ago about, you know, when you go into industry, the soft skills, those important skills, reliability, showing up to work on time, mm-hmm. you know, some hygiene, uh, understanding, you know, how, how to work with people. Those are important, important skills that, that people uh, sometimes just overlook. We, we, we sometimes, some of us take that for granted. Uh, so it, it's nice to hear you echo the same thing that we are seeing and hearing. Uh, from employers, uh, those are important needs in other industries. So, um, and especially in, in a kitchen, you're going to need those kinds of things. You do. Uh, yeah, you did leave out something that that I, I'm curious about here. When I when I think of chefs, you know, I I have a picture of hey, there's the single chef over there. But a lot of times we see in movies, we see that chefs are part of a team. You're in a you're in a larger kitchen. Mm-hmm. You're one of a, a moving group of people who are, you know, preparing meals. I mean, mm-hmm. teamwork is is also part of that equation for success, isn't it? Teamwork is paramount. That's one of the things that. So, in my job now with performance, I have two other great coworkers that I work with, and it, that makes all the difference because I have people that I rely on. I know that they rely on me. And in a kitchen, that's all you are. You are relying on the person next to you. You're relying on your line cooks and your sous chef and uh, everybody in the restaurant, really. And you're right about the soft skills, because if the back of the house is not good along with the front of the house, then it's going to be a train wreck. Mm -hmm. Uh, I've spoken with many people today even about how the teamwork in the kitchen makes everything flow. Because once that ticket comes in, you have somebody that calls the ticket out to the rest of the line. And then the saute guy gets to understand what what his timing is on his dishes versus what the timing is on the grill versus what the timing is for the pantry person that's doing the salads or the desserts. So there's many stations in there and they all have to work together and understand the timing of what station A does versus what station B does. And it's, it's a really, it's just a orchestra. It's a conducted orchestra back there that people have to understand. And it takes, it takes time. It takes time to really feel that through and, and, and get the timing down properly. Yeah. Teamwork is yeah. It's a big deal. Yeah. So, so well said. Um, and you made, a, you made another great point there that I don't think about it. It's that back side of the house, you know, the kitchen area, part that a customer probably doesn't see you know that customer sees uh the front end of the house if you will the people who are serving them the food but if that food's not right you know that that plays backwards and and comes back to you know the kitchen and whatever happened in there customers notice the front side but it's that whole team 
that makes that thing come together. Great mm -hmm. point uh, uh, that you're making there. Speaking of which, I, I, I'm really curious. Now, you, you've had the opportunity to manage a large chef, uh, mm -hmm. group of chefs or cooks, right? Mm -hmm. You know, when, when you hire people to come work for you, Jason, in addition to those soft skills in there, what, what other things are you looking for when you make those hires? So as a hiring manager, I definitely look for, uh, I mean, the soft skills are there and, and you're really reading people right off the bat. As soon as they walk in the door, you're looking, are they on time? Are they early? How do they carry themselves? How do they present themselves? Because that's going to be, you know, some key factors of how they work for you. Are they going to be early to their job? Are they going to be presentable? Are they going to present their food at the way they present themselves? If they come in and they're nicely, you know, groomed and cleaned and crisp white chef jacket, then that tells me I take pride in myself and I'm going to take pride in my food and my appearance and my kitchen space and, you know, the way that they speak and the way that they talk. Uh, is it all about me? Is it me, me, me? Or is it, hey, you know, tell me about this restaurant. Tell me about the food that you make. Tell me about the staff. Uh, you know, this job that I'm in now, I think I interviewed about four or five times and it really wasn't them interviewing me as much as it was them just seeing what type of person I was because they want the culture to be uh, right in, in this uh, environment, right? Because if the culture's off, then everything's going to be off. You don't want one person coming in and poisoning the rest of the staff. Oh yeah. Well said. Well said. Yeah. That's uh, in another way that I hear that sometimes is they're looking for fit. Every organization mm -hmm. wants to make sure that they hire somebody who's going to fit in with them. And it, the new person coming on board, you know, I, I don't always think of it this way, but they are also looking at you you know, they obviously they want a great job, but they're also looking to make sure this is a place I can fit in. Mm -hmm. This is a place I do want to work at. Uh, so in, in a way, it's kind of a two way, two street interview, more so from the employer side. Uh, I think fit is so, so important. And in particular with respect to some of the finer points of the job, you want people that you can trust to take, take that and, and run with it. Um, one of the uh, one of the things in a, in a prior job I had that you know I, I did get hired and then turned around to hire somebody and, and that person said, well no I can do that but you got to train me first you know and I go well that that's not right but there is some of that you do train people uh, as they come into you you want them to have some some basic skills but you want them to learn it you know your company's way your organization's way you want that fit to grow I imagine that's so important uh, within a kitchen staff too. It is because you'll have many, many times you'll hear, well, you know, the last kitchen, the last chef that I had, the last place that I worked, this is what we did. Like, well, that's what you did there. And, and you say that, but I mean, once again, you take those ideas and you steal them and make them your own. If they're good ideas, yeah. you say, that's a great idea, you know, because hopefully you've hired somebody that you do trust or you can build that trust with and you hired them for whatever skills and, and background that they did have. Yeah, yeah. When, when you do hiring events, do you always hire, like, do you hire in groups or do you just go for, hey, I need to replace one person? Is that what you look for? Is there a Typically, you hire one person. And right now, labor is such an issue in the industry that, um, you know, there's, there's kind of a shift in food service at the moment. Because if I don't have the labor to do what I need to do, how do I keep producing the quality products that I need to produce? And, and that's where uh, food service brokers, distributors, manufacturers can come in because we have convenience products now that are coming leaps and bounds where if I'm not a barbecue establishment, but I want to serve barbecue on my menu, well, now I have a 14-hour hardwood smoked barbecue that comes in frozen that I can just thaw out enough to serve. And now I have a great quality product that I didn't have to pay somebody 14 hours to go outside and smoke. So... Uh, to answer your initial question, though, you do, you normally just replace one. You replace the the wheel that's broken. And because labor is such an issue, it's about 30% of your uh, budget there. So I don't want to overstaff. Uh, and, you know, I really can't bring somebody and say, well, I'm going to work you one day a week until Joe quits. And then I'm going to have right. you replace Joe. So right. you know, typically one at a time. Yeah, yeah. 
Yeah, and and you bring up another area that 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 I I'm sensitive to here where we work is when you bring somebody on, you know, you want them to uh, want them to demonstrate early their success. You want them to be seen as a value to that team, but they also have to grow. And so you're always, at least I am always thinking of how do I give this person space? How do I give this person recognition? How do I let them show, you know, the excellence that they bring to us also? I imagine in any industry, in any team effort, you know, you want to get there quickly, but you have to allow for, for different people and different, different times. You may not have that luxury, though, in the food service industry because you're, you're, on, you're on the line. So to speak, you're on the line right away, aren't you? That's right. Yes. And I mean, there's really not a lot of training that goes into it. You know, if I hire you as a saute cook, I expect you to be able to come in and run the saute line. You should mm-hmm. know what's going to happen if you put a hot skillet on, you know, and and have to throw something in there that it's going to be hot and it's going to cause a flame and it's going to sizzle and pop and probably burn you. And, you know, I, there's not a lot of time for training. That is one of the problems, it's kind of trial by fire, so to speak, because you jump in and it's sink or swim. You know, if you can't yeah. keep up, then you crack and you're not going to make it in the kitchen. Uh, and so it's it's definitely a high uh, energy, fast paced, longer hours, hard on the body <laughs> industry that is very rewarding. I love it and I've, uh, I can't get out of it, obviously, but yeah. it's definitely something that is not for the uh, faint of heart. There's a lot of personalities on a team and a lot of those personalities in a kitchen, normally back of the house people were never seen. We're always mm-hmm. in the back. And so there's colorful commentary, colorful <laughs> language, <laughs> colorful jokes. There's all sorts of things that uh, can happen in a kitchen that <laughs> will definitely not be shared to the general public. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah. And every place has its own culture and works with that. I understand. You know, when 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 people come to you and, and I think of you as, as like one of the best chefs we've ever had the opportunity to associate with your, your you. level of uh, experience, uh, what you bring to just what we've talked about is always incredible. But when people come to you, you know, do do you have that? Hey, let me sit down and tell you what this is going to be like talk and here's where you can go in my kitchen. Do people aspire to become chef Jason or do they, they say, I've got to serve here for a while and then I'll go to another company. Well, I mean, with my, my company that I'm in, I'm really, there's the, just the two chefs that are there and we really don't hire anybody else underneath us as far as cooks go. But in the kitchen, uh, I would always try to bring somebody in who did have that passion, whether they aspire to be, uh, Chef Jason, I hope they can be above and beyond Chef Jason and go and do huge, awesome things. Uh, the best you can do is, like I said, hire somebody that has that passion, because if they have the passion, they're going to listen and they're going to learn. And hopefully they absorb everything I had to offer and then just, you know, keep soaring up through the sky. Um, but it's once again, it, it takes time because, you know, you only cook so many things a day, but really, it's about technique. It's all about technique. Just like if you're a runner, there's a technique to running. It's more than putting one foot from the other. You know, it's it's more than not falling. <laughs> but it, it that, that's how cooking is. Cooking has some basic techniques. And you get those techniques down. And then it's a matter of applying, hey, do I want to go an Asian route? Or do I want to go a Hispanic route? Or do I want to go modern American? Like, where do I want to take these techniques? And then you just apply those. So it, there is some training that goes into it, and a passionate person will pick that up. Yeah, uh, that's I, well said. Go so ahead. I have a quick question. Have you ever hired anyone that just surprised you, that you thought might be mediocre, and then they just rose above and beyond? Uh, yes. Um, I think the funniest story that comes to mind, though, honestly, <clears throat> is I didn't hire this person. When I worked at the governor's mansion, we had trustees that worked there. And these were convicted felons that lived off, uh, you know, about 10 miles down the road, and they would report to the governor's mansion every day. One of those was a former police officer, and he was also a former hospital administrator. So as a police officer, he quit, went to be a hospital administrator. He got involved in some narcotic stuff there and was, was arrested. And 
at the mansion, I was uh, going to host the chef's ball. So we had all the chefs coming in and we we're going to have all the 10 course dinner and all the things. And I was going to do bread. Well, I'm not a baker. And so I'm sitting here struggling over this bread. And this guy comes up. He said, what you reading? I'm like, well, I'm trying to figure out the bread, you know, whatever. And kind of dismissed him. And he said, what kind of bread do you make it? Well, I don't know. That's what I'm trying to figure out. You know, I'm a little <laughs> put out at the moment. Like, what? My, what? And just he was washing my dishes and doing whatever. And he was, he was about probably mid fifties. And he said, well, you know, I sure do like Shibata bread. I'm like, yeah, I do too. You know, it's really good. He said, you know, if you get me some King Arthur flour and a scale, I could make you some. Maybe you'd be able to serve that. What do you know about bread? I, said, oh, I mean, you know, before I was a police officer, I owned a bakery in Fort Smith. Like, you did what? <laughs> and so I went and got him a bag of King Arthur flour and some scales. And this guy made the starter dough and he let it sit and rest and did all the things. And now we're chopping out little slippers of bread and he's throwing this in my oven at 500 degrees and throwing ice in there, creating steam and making some of the best ciabatta bread I'd ever seen in my life. And that right there was a moment you go, okay, you don't have underestimate anybody. I don't care who <laughs> they are, what you're doing. You take nothing for granted. And you say, Hey, you know what I think about bread? And they say, yeah. And so, yes, that's, that's probably the funniest instance where I was not expecting anything and got a hundred thousand percent uh, more than I could have ever done, you know, and it was awesome bread and awesome time. But yeah, there's people out there who definitely surprise you come in. And I love that when they don't speak highly of themselves, they undersell themselves and then they over deliver. That's always mm -hmm. been my thing with catering or a restaurant. Like, yes, I can do that. I'm not going to tell you I'm going to blow it out of the water, but I'm going to give it my all. And 75% of the time, <laughs> <laughs> I should see, but, but no, it's a, that's a great question too, because it is awesome. I love seeing that. I love seeing somebody just come in and sail way higher than you ever thought possible. Yeah. So neat. Great question, Angela. And, and a great story to follow that up with uh, uh, chef Jason, you probably heard our timer go off and, and I, we didn't even get through two thirds of the questions that I had in my mind, but, but we're going to try and start wrapping this up. However, are, are you still doing chefing of the podcast or are you kicking back on that one for a while? So I, 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 it's on my heart right now to pick it back up just because uh -huh. I'd be able to utilize all the chefs that I'm talking to on a daily basis. Now, when I started my new job, there was a lot of training, a lot of learning that goes into that. And so I put it on the, the back burner, so to speak. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. But it, it's time. It's time to to get off my lazy chef hiney and start doing it again. So oh, man. It was, I've got two of them that are unpublished. And I think that's what's what's dragging me down is because that's the part that I don't like doing the most. And so yeah. I just need to publish those and get them out there. Yeah, well, I, I encourage you to do that. You have great, you have great charisma, good working with lots and lots of the stories out there. I think that that's amazing. And there's a lot of people who can enjoy that. If somebody wanted to learn more about the world of chefs and they want to reach out to you, I mean, are you open to sharing how, how they could contact you or sure. tell them to come watch your, uh, your podcast? And what would you say to them? So you can listen to Chef and Podcast with Chef Jason on all the uh, typical podcast channels there. So you got Spotify and Google and uh, Apple Podcasts. Then, you know, my email address is chefandpodcast at gmail.com. So yeah, yeah, hit me up if you have any questions about it. Yeah. Oh, man. Thank you so much. And thank you on behalf of a lot of those folks out there who have that passion that you've been describing. And uh, thank you again for over delivering. Uh, uh, you, <laughs> you do you do a fantastic job. Uh, I want to thank uh, thank you for coming back and you know part two. Look forward to another another opportunity somewhere in the fall time just to to talk a little bit further about chefs and maybe get a story from you on where you're at right now. Uh, it's fun talking to you again, again, Chef Chef Jason Knapp and Angela Wilhelm. Uh, thank you, Angela, for joining us. Uh, we're going to have to close this one out right now. I don't know. Do you want to do Paul's bit, or would you like me to give that one a shot? Go ahead. You cut it down. <laughs> All right, everybody. Uh, we're we're uh, we're going to wrap up uh, this uh, this version of uh, this podcast for uh, Sweet Talk. I want to thank all of you for joining us. Uh, if you want to reach out to us and learn something more about what we're doing here at Continuing Workforce Training, uh, please uh, please go ahead and uh, look us up on online. Uh, we're at uh, cetrain.isu.edu, uh, or you can reach us at cetrain at uh, isu.edu. Or as Paul is fond of saying, you can call us. 
208 282 3372. And uh, we look forward to getting that feedback. You've been an awesome audience, and uh, thank you very much. You all be safe out there.